طيب بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تمسك بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار in the name of Allah the most gracious the most glorious the most sublime the only one worthy of our worship, our praise, our glorification. I send salutations and prayers and peace upon the finality of prophets and messengers, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon his family, his companions, and all who follow him in righteousness until the day of judgment. Beloved brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, we are continuing on, inshallah ta'ala, in this beautiful uh, book that we have been going through um, titled When Muslim Marriages Fail, Divorce Chronicles and Commentaries. And we have been looking at this because we want to see what a failed model looks like. We talked about successful models. Now we want to talk about what failed models look like so that we can be able to analyze them and see where they went wrong, why they went wrong, and how we can prevent from those things happening in our lives as well. We have basically um, three more sessions, what it seems like, inshallah ta'ala, um, from this inshallah um, series, either two or three inshallah ta'ala. And then um, we'll be done with this and we'll be moving on to um, something else after this inshallah ta'ala. So today the title is called From Embers to Ashes. And like always, we read the case study together, and then we analyze the case study, inshallah ta'ala. And I want to begin by asking Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala and asking everyone who's watching to please make dua for my sister. I ask you, ya Allah, allow my sister to give birth to a young, healthy baby boy, inshallah ta'ala, my nephew, who's going to be named Eli. Um, and may he make it easy for her. She is in her way, on her way into the room for her C-section. She tried to have a natural, but قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَفَعَلَ Allah does what he wills. And the human beings have no control over that. So alhamdulillah, we're asking Allah for a healthy birth, for healthy delivery, and that they both come out healthy and good, inshallah ta'ala. We ask you, Allah, you're the one all capable of doing that. I mean. So the case study we're looking at her story. Um, this is going to be a story about two people who got married overseas in Syria, and then they migrate to the Americas together, inshallah ta'ala. So she starts her story saying, I should have listened to my father years ago when he urged me not to marry him. The first time my husband came to propose, my father laughed in his face and said, you can take the doorman away from the door, but you can't take the door away from the doorman. Was he ever right? The man I married ruined my life. Everything bitter in my life came from him and the only sweetness was in the form of my children who he, who he eventually turned against me. The alienation of my children, the lack of intimacy in our lives, the mistreatment of my family and the robbing of my youth and my future were all that I got from this marriage, subhanAllah. How different would my life have been if I chose a more worthy suitor as my husband? There had been plenty of suitors for me to choose from. I was pretty, 
as a blossom before he swindled me into falling for him. Men from as far as two towns over came to court me and asked for my hand in marriage. Even as my parents begged and pleaded, even as my parents begged and pleaded, I invariably stuck to my stubborn ways and held out for the man I was convinced to be my true love. Now that I know, now I know that true and perfect love for anyone other than Allah and the Prophet وسلم, doesn't really exist. But my young heart, influenced by the romantic music and the movies of those days, insisted on waiting for the man who had promised me the stars beneath the balcony years ago. As the years slipped by and I felt my appealing, I felt my appeal beginning to fade, I had more than a few moments to worry about. He had already traveled abroad. And I was terrified that he would find some beautiful American to marry instead of me. It took a greater deal of prayer and patience for me to stand up to my parents' marriage choices and insist that I would wait for my Prince Charming. They say that absence makes the heart grow fonder. And in his absence, I imagined my future husband as the picture of perfection. He was everything that an ideal husband could possibly be. And I was sure that we would have nothing but happiness when he whisked me away from the shambles of Syria to the golden paved streets of America, subhanAllah. I was the envy of all of my friends when he came back wearing wealth in his fancy suit and shiny, and shiny shoes. Not only was I marrying a rich man, but I was going to be transplanted to America to experience things my cousins, friends, and neighbors could only ever hear about. I was on cloud nine during that time, ecstatic as could be. I mapped out my prospects with my future husband. Everyone seemed to forget where he had first come from as the gleam of the dollar freely, freely replaced their preconceived notions of his family status. Only his parents and siblings acted as if I was a poor choice of a bride. They should have been honored that I would have even accepted this man despite his initial station in life. The dislike I developed for his family continued even after I left the country in direct response to the obvious disdain they unbashedly showed me. Once we arrived in America, I was surprised that the country looked rather ordinary and not much like the images I had seen in my dreams. No golden paved roads, huh? All the same, I was grateful to have the chance to experience something different, especially since I knew that this was just a temporary move. Although we hadn't clearly laid out the parameters for how long we would remain as immigrants in the US, I was sure that just as soon as we missed, as soon as we'd amass a large enough sum to live comfortably in our native homeland, we would return back to Syria. I estimated that it would not be more than a year, maybe two at most. In order to speed up the process, I agreed to find a job to help increase our savings. I accepted a position that was way beneath my station in life as a cafeteria lady in a large public school. Besides the belittlement a belittling comments that I had to endure from the students. My husband insisted on picking up my paychecks and only giving me what money he thought I should spend on groceries every week. Although I was annoyed at his actions, I had no one to discuss this with, to see whether or not he was right in keeping me in the dark about our joint finances. He was keeping me in the dark regarding quite a few things, such as anything related to bills, bank accounts, signing checks, or any matter that might have some rational thought involved. Even though I had only completed my education up to middle school back home, I knew that I wasn't stupid. Yet as a high school graduate, my husband seemed to always dismiss my ideas or opinions as having no value. He never wanted to hear what I had to say, nor did he ever carry a conversation of much substance with me. It wasn't until I met another woman slightly older than me at the supermarket that my eyes were finally opened. The woman became my closest friend. And even today, I only have her to stand beside me through thick and thin. That day, I was horribly embarrassed to admit that I did not have an extra penny to spare on the fruits that looked so sweet because my husband had not included them on his rationed list. She was shocked at this type of treatment and gave me a good talking to about asserting my personality rather than having him walk all over me. It was as if his years of poverty as the son of a doorman had taught him to yield a tight fist with his own household. When I confronted him with the knowledge my new friend had given me, 
He shouted and cursed like a true street beggar. And I realized that I was just now seeing his true colors. Not only had he been, not only had he been taking my money and giving me what little he decided was enough, but he was also sending more than half of our earnings back home to support his lazy siblings. As if it weren't bad enough that he was reaping my hard earned money as if I were his slave, he also insisted that my own family needed no financial help. And he would not send them a single penny. I was outraged by his attitude and began plotting all sorts of miseries, all, so, all sorts of misery that I could put him through as a payback for his mon monstrous ways. I longed to go back home where any one of my brothers or uncles would have straightened them out for mistreating me. Instead, I was stuck alone in this country with no one to turn to. I clung to my new friend and confided everything in her. She gave me advice that continued to sustain me throughout my broken marriage. He would not allow me to go back to work after I threatened to keep all of my paychecks and to spend them on myself and my family. Although I wanted to rebel against his orders, I was secretly pleased not to have to go back to that demeaning position. But I also wondered what I would do with the loneliness of my long days. He was used to leaving for work at dawn and coming home late into the night to eat and sleep. Our weekends were spent in much of the same uh, monotonous way, only broken up uh, with an occasional visit to, the distant, uh, uh, to a distant acquaintance. Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, I didn't have to worry for long. Soon after I began to stay home, I found out that I was pregnant and I would be expecting. I was thrilled that I was suddenly, uh, I would suddenly have something to do with myself. I also knew that now was a good time for me to return to my home country to have the baby amidst my family and familiarity. Again, my husband showed his true mean spirited nature and refused to let me go. I was devastated and he knew it, but he did nothing to try to alleviate my pain. In the long years, I had to stay apart from my family. I made sure to call them consistently and to mail lots of pictures of the baby with long letters of false happiness every chance that I could. With pricey diapers and formula added to our shopping list, I suddenly found that I had more leverage in making him increase my grocery allowance accordingly. I also learned to clip coupons and save the extra little bit of grocery money under a loose floorboard in our tiny apartment closet. I really didn't want to lie to him and hide money for my family. But every time I brought up the topic of helping my family out, he refused and insisted that we needed no monetary help. Oh, that, um, that we, needed, uh, we needed monetary help more than they did. His unfair treatment of my family as opposed to how he spoiled his siblings made me jealous and made, me jealous, uh, made my jealousy and hatred towards his family flourish even more in my heart. Even though we had long passed the one or two year mark of temporary abode, that I had initially envisioned, I still held out hope that I would eventually be able to return home to my homeland and raise my children among my friends and family. My husband was becoming more and more encultured into the American way. And I hated the feeling that I might one day lose my ethnic identity. He'd become a total mercenary, always running after the next way to make a dollar. Yet the extra money he earned was never spent on us. Whenever I tried to question the household finances, he would jump down my throat and act as if I crossed some immutable line and completely overstepped my boundaries. I decided that if I didn't force him to spend money on our needs and wants, then his siblings would be the only ones to benefit from what rightfully belonged to us. I began ordering lavish uh, accoutrements for the apartment I had wheeled and uh, that I had weddled and beg begged him uh, to buy for us in Syria. For the most expensive, from the most expensive new furniture to the most up-to-date water heaters and pumps, I wanted to make sure our home in Syria was worth my long years of exile, even if that meant skimping on the name brand sneakers my kids wanted or buying secondhand furniture for our small American apartment. After I delivered my fifth child amidst constant arguments and accusations, we both realized that our loveless marriage really only had one purpose which was to maintain some semblance of normalcy for the sake of our children, subhanAllah. Yet I am positive that children, even from the youngest age, can sense discord and hatred between parents. I grew more and more bitter as the years passed and I found myself imprisoned in the country. I always felt a stranger. 
As the kids grew older, it became harder to imagine our return to Syria. My husband worked night and day like a dog and barely had a presence in the household. Late at night, we would each retreat to our own rooms, subhanAllah. We would each retreat to our own rooms with hardly any civility towards each other, although I would never admit it. Years later, I longed for some sort of intimacy or even one of his awkward embraces just to make me feel like a human being again. It was as if the lack of intimacy I had with my husband had been inherently directed, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, inherited directly by each of my children as well, who all avoided hugging and kissing like the plague. I loved my children much more um, than I had ever loved my husband, but being home with them all the time was draining. In retaliation for not letting me get involved with the household finance, financial decisions, I decided that he would not be allowed to get involved with the decisions of raising our children. He was not around enough to know what was happening in their lives anyway. From arguments about not wanting to go to the Islamic weekend school at the mosque, to late night pleas of wanting to go out <coughs> on a date or, or to the prom, I felt like I was losing control of my kids. But I would not let him step into my domain. At least in this, I needed to succeed alone. The more entrenched in American society that my children and I became, the further and further thoughts of Syria slipped to the back of my mind. I still held out hope that at least one of my three daughters would find a nice Syrian doctor back home who would put everything into the right order after marriage. What I hadn't accounted for was that the difficulty of marrying all five children who had grown to adulthood in the sham of a marriage and had a very negative view of the entire institution of marriage. Because he had to be involved when suitors came to the door, I grudgingly included my husband in our marriage discussions. Yet his only focus in questioning the proposing individual revolved around money alone. How much did the man make? How much was he planning to spend on the wedding? How much did he have saved in the bank? How much, how much, how much? His obvious love of money embarrassed me and his daughters as the suitors all seemed to be scared off by his mercenary ways never to return again. Soon enough, my daughters took the matters into their own hands, each one choosing a companion who was the complete opposite of what we were looking for, Allah and insisting that this was the person they would marry. Although I felt like they were all falling into doomed unions, I was powerless to stop their downward spirals. Rather than putting his foot down, their father just stood by and let it happen. He could care less about the future of his children, as long as he did not have to touch his precious money in the meantime. My sons fared, fared no better in their future. They had both sworn off our help in arranging for a suitable marriage and moved out of the house to go to college and choose their own brides without a backward glance. No amount of insistence could make them change their minds. Even now, I only occasionally hear from them. And when they do call, it is in a rush and superficial manner on a birthday or Mother's Day once or twice a year. My husband's horrible ways had turned my own children into individualistic Americans in the truest sense of the word. No ties to culture, no ties to home, no family existed for them, yet I knew that it was a mother's job to continue reaching out even though my efforts were consistently rebuffed. My daughters all had children of their own, even though I had pinned for my parents, uh, uh, pinned for my parents during my years of sol uh, sol solitary, uh, solitary labor, my daughters refused to even allow me to enter the hospital room with them during the birth of each child. I soon gave up even on traveling to the distant states each one lived in for the births of their children because they made it painstakingly obvious that they did not want me to be there. Throughout these ordeals, and we're almost coming to an end, throughout these ordeals that were tearing me up inside, my husband, as usual, took a solitary and silent stance. He seemed unfazed by what was happening to our family. It was as if he was satisfied with the job he'd done in financially supporting the kids and no longer felt any connection or obligation towards them. Upon realizing this, I felt a horrible emptiness or horrible emptiness envelop me. I no longer wanted to see my, my close friend, my one close friend, nor attended Friday prayers at the mosque or even call the one or two distant remaining relatives that I had left in Syria. It was at this lowest point that he decided to taunt me with something I'd longed to hear from him or longed to hear him say for years. 
as I felt my family slipping ready, my family slipping between my fingers, he strode into my bedroom and said he was now ready to move back to Syria. I couldn't believe the pompous pig. He had alienated me from my family and the people I loved back home for years. And now that they were all dead and gone, he was, going, he was ready to return to Syria? I couldn't believe his arrogant self-centeredness. I screamed at him and let loose all the pent up anger that had been building over the past several years. I hurled every imaginable insult at him with the intention of truly wounding him. But I'm not sure if the words even got past his thick skin. Infuriatingly, he didn't shout back. He simply nodded and smiled and told me he'd already purchased a ticket. And if I was interested in joining him, I should let him know. I hurled a crystal vase at his head on his way out of the room, hoping it would hit him hard. It missed him by a mile and shattered into a million pieces all over the floor as I crumbled up and cried. The shards of glass on the bedroom floor looked like they had a better chance of being pieced together and transformed into, the, into a hole again than I ever did. He traveled to Syria without me that year as I insisted that my children needed me near them. The lies sounded hollow even to my own ears, yet this scene of defiance made me feel like I had some semblance of control over my own decisions. It was not up to him to decide to move to Syria when it suited his purposes. I had a right to make decisions too. I sunk deeper and deeper into, the, into a catatonic state of depression while he was gone. I devoted the best years of my life solely to raising my children, keeping a clean house and laundered clothes for my family and cooking meal after meal like the family housekeeper rather than respect, a respected wife and mother. Now, what did I have to show for those wasted years? Nothing. I had dreamed of finishing my education as my friend had, but he had, but he always stood in my way telling me that I wouldn't succeed and that it would just be money thrown away. His lack of encouragement always made me shut down and change the subject right away. I never developed any hobbies other than my mediocre cooking skills and my great irony, but neither of these skills were actually marketable in a respectable job. So I just kept pretending that the children needed me and that they could not survive without me. When in reality, I knew that it was really the other way around. I didn't want to return to Syria without my children, a broken old lady who gained nothing but heartache from the great country of America. Yet after a few visits to Syria alone, I could tell that something was out of sorts. He began to take great care in the clothes he packed, mostly packing pretentious outfits that still had outrageous price tags on them. The stinginess in him usually caused him to dress like a pauper buying only discounted clothes off the sales rack of department stores. I knew that something must have been going on to instigate this new attention on his appearance. When I confronted him, he insisted that he was meeting up with old friends and wanted to make sure that they could see his marks of success from America. <laughs> I thought that he might actually be telling the truth because I had seen how much care and thought he put into dealing with everyone other than his wife and kids. I had grown accustomed in the past to running into people he worked with while we were out with, some, with the kids somewhere and he would take several steps ahead of us, never introducing his family to the invariably American friend and glanced sheepishly, sheepish, uh, sheepishly down at it as his coworkers used to make, uh, used his made up more English friendly name rather than the name we knew him by. His kindness um, towards these strangers always made me wonder what his true intentions were. Year after year passed un un uneventfully, and I assumed that he displayed a split personality, but I no longer had enough personal investment in our relationship to really care what did work, what, what he did at work. Maybe I should have paid more attention back then. Maybe I should have realized that I was married to a phil philandering imbecile. It wasn't long before the harsh truth was ringing in my ears, although he denied it. I was sure that he'd known this woman, he'd known this woman in Syria and had become intimate with her either in the halal way of a second wife or otherwise. His ardent denials were nothing but lies. I stood steadfast in my convictions and asked him for a divorce. His quick, his quick agreement just confirmed my suspicions. I've been divorced. I've been a divorced woman for three years now and still feel miserably alone. My husband kids and even friends have abandoned me with the advice that time heals all wounds. But I know that there are some gaping injuries that nothing will ever mend. Thankfully, in solitude, 
even pain is sometimes a welcome and a worthy companion. And that is the end of her side of the story, inshallah ta'ala. So like last week, I opened it up first, inshallah ta'ala. If anybody wants to come in and comment, inshallah ta'ala. Again, if you need to be unmiked, you can be unmiked. Um, or if you want to go ahead and write it down in the chat, you can write it down in the chat or on Facebook. If you're joining us on Facebook, inshallah ta'ala. Let us know what you thought about her side of the story so far. Next week, we'll see his side. Um, and then I'll share some of my... Uh, reflections, inshallah ta'ala, with all of you, uh, depending on whether you guys uh, step up and speak or not. <laughs> so if you can't uh, unmute, uh, mic yourself, um, just raise your hand and I'll unmic you, but you should be able to unmic them. Hopefully I've solved that issue. But let's see. Anyone? All right, Munira. Bismillah. Go ahead, Munira. You should be able to. Assalamualaikum. Um, I think from reading the story, it sounds like the sister one she uh, agreed to the marriage on false pretense. It wasn't, you know, there was nothing for the intentions were wrong from the beginning, to say the least. Um, and it seems like she also always looked down upon him because the, of the way that she you know, spoke about him, he's, I forgot the word, the term that she used, but she always felt like she was more worthy. Um, she had a higher status than him. And I don't think that's, you know, that's not a healthy way to enter a marriage if you feel like you're superior than the other person. Mm -hmm. um, it also sounded like she was more focused on materialistic things and it, the marriage became a tick for attack um, mm -hmm. instead of working together. And I personally think that's why the kids saw the discord in the household and, you know, led to like them having no respect for either parents and wanted to just be far away from all of them. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. MashaAllah, great MashaAllah uh, um, reflection on the story. And definitely um, you saw that, you know, she referred to him as her father referred to him, right? As a doorman, right? You can take the doorman away from the door, but you can't take the door away from the doorman, right? That was the statement of her dad. And uh, subhanAllah, so that he had some type of, you know, impoverished life uh, prior to him going to America. And then it seems like when he went to America, he bought himself some nice clothes and who knows what type of clothes these, these were. Because now when you kind of fast forward to the end of the story, it didn't seem like he had too good of a job in America either, right? He was kind of, you know, trying to make money wherever he could. But when he came back, in her mind, because he was looking sharp. He had some new clothes on, right? He was, mashallah, you know, if he left maybe the tags on, like she has said, you know, and according to the, you know, probably what the cost of that stuff may have been in her country, you know, in, in relations to America, it was like, he's rich, right? <laughs> and as she mentioned, he's going to take me back to the gold paved streets of America, right? The false notion that many people have that when they come from overseas to America, that the streets are paved in gold, that here it rains money, and that subhanAllah, they're going to have the white, the big white house with the big white picket fence. All of these um, false notions that many have. Is it achievable? Yes, it is. But do many achieve it? Many don't achieve it, unfortunately, right? Um, but, you know, she had that notion, and then it seemed that when she came to America, as she saw, you know, they were living in this little apartment and it was like, you know, now, you know, she was thinking they were gonna save money for two years and leave. And so much so that she even had to work, right? She said, well, I'll work to get and add to the bundle so that we can get back home, you know, but, and then he was basically taking all of her money, subhanAllah. And then we see that, you know, um, all of this led up to some sort of, um, you know, argumentation and, 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 and some, uh, back and forth between the spouses that really shouldn't have been seen by their children. And later on in life, the children want nothing to do with either of them, subhanAllah, right? Um, and which is a very important point, you know, Sister Munira, mashallah, you know, Allah, Allah bless you for that reflection that, um, you know, you need to be careful in marriage as, as to what you present to your children, right? Because whatever you present to your children, you know, you can be breaking them in the future, inshallah, right? Or, you know, you can be um, putting in their minds, you know, 
I don't ever want what my parents ever had because that was just a mess, right? SubhanAllah, and may Allah forbid that our children look at our marriages in that, in that state and in that way, and that they look at our family structures like that, right? SubhanAllah, that's heartbreaking um, that, you know, your child looks back and says, you know, I never want to be like mom or dad. And, you know, those relationships were, were horrifying, right? And they just kind of run away from everything, including the parents after that, you know, and may Allah save us from that, inshallah ta'ala. Um, when I, anybody else want to share before I go back and uh, reflect any, uh, on any other points that I have in there? Don't be shy. Alhamdulillah. This is the purpose of the book club. <laughs> Okay, so I'll start off a little bit, and then you guys can jump right in, inshallah ta'ala, if you want. Um, you know, she, again, she, we talked about her thing, and this was her true love. Um, the other thing, right, she said, but my young heart influenced by the romantic music and the movies of those days assisted on waiting for the man who had promised me the stars beneath the balconies years ago, right? And we talked about this again, right? And, 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 and it's, it's We've talked about it in the past, and it's just amazing how you see the same thing recur in different people's lives over and over again, right? Showing us that these things are obviously fallacy, right? You have those individuals who are looking at Bollywood and Hollywood and all of these shows of, you know, the person, you know, I love at first sight and, you know, marriage this and marriage that and you know going to buy the dress and the people are like oh my god i want my marriage to be like that and oh my god i wish i could fall in love the way she fell in love and that i see somebody and you know our hearts automatically they're attached and they're one and i'm running through meadows of grass and you know we jump in the air and we just hug and kiss each other and allahu akbar right you know subhanallah <laughs> right those were carefully written scripts right for people to you know market your heart so that you engage with the show and so that you come back and continue to be a consumer, right? In many instances, it doesn't happen that way, right? It doesn't happen that you know you just see that person just like, ah, I lost my breath, right? It doesn't happen that way. Can you feel that way in time? Can you feel that love? Can you feel that passion? Absolutely, right? But it doesn't happen on that first date like that, you know what I mean, with your legs going up in the air as you hug and you kiss and, you know, subhanAllah biladin, right? So again, you know, coming back to reality, brothers and sisters, inshallah, you know, get out of the Hollywood and Bollywood reality and come back to real life, inshallah, and set your marriage up based on real life experience, okay? Not what you've seen in the movies, inshallah ta'ala, because if you base it on what you've seen in the movies, you're looking for a heartbreak and heartache, okay? Um, she also talked about, um, you know, her surprise that when he came back to America, like we mentioned, you know, it hadn't been as she imagined in her dreams, right? And way too often this happens with people, you know, they come here and, you know, sometimes they think they're going to have it much better, and sometimes they do. And then in a lot of instances, they don't, you know, they end up in shelters, they end up in hotels, they end up with difficult situations. You know, unfortunately, sometimes this is the case, unfortunately, you know, and not only with foreigners that come from other countries, sometimes even like after Hurricane Maria, we have people come from Puerto Rico to the States, right? And we're accustomed to coming to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is our custom to come to, uh, to America, right? And they just like, listen, I'm going back home. I'm going back to the island. I'd rather rough it out in the island and be there than come back than be in America. You know what I mean? With that oppressive type of system. And it's just too difficult there, right? So um, they know how to maneuver and survive already where they're at and coming into a new place and learning how to maneuver and survive here. Sometimes it becomes very difficult. Go ahead, Omar. Jump in, man. Assalamu um, alaikum. SubhanAllah is, is, is real. I mean, you just mentioned like the thing about like Puerto Rico, right? You know, like, I can't tell you, um, you know, being being Dominican, right, coming from Dominican background, and obviously, like, you know, being being in a community of Muslims, where like, you know, a lot of the older brothers, they're also, you know, um, they're also first generation or immigrants themselves, and they're surprised at how much I know their side of the story, and 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 I'm like, yo, because my people have gone through the same thing. Like, it's so repetitive, subhanAllah, and it's very interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, um, 
yeah, it's not a coincidence, right? You know, the propaganda and the amount of dollars that goes into, you know, putting this story together, um, whether you talk about Coca-Cola ads overseas and something very simple, you know, subhanAllah. And um, it, it just goes to show like the Zina, right? Like what people fill their eyes and their ears with mm -hmm. and what types of expectations that sets and what people are willing to do to kind of like keep that front. Look how she um, was miserable and she would admit it. And only her friend actually knew about it, but her parents were receiving these long letters. Like, think about that, you know? Um, and pictures and these things and, you know, subhanAllah, um, it's, it's, it's strange and it's very difficult to get those expectations and ground yourself, come back down to earth once you already have these ideas why? Because many times you feel like when somebody tells you, well, you got to be realistic, most people take it as, well, I have to lower my standards now, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily the case because it's like, well, are you perfect? You know what I'm saying? You're, you're talking to, you're talking down on your husband, you know, like your family is, your perception already on him is messed up, you know? So you, Yanni, it's, 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 it's very challenging, you know, to say the least, um, at that point to kind of like ground yourself once your eyes have been filled up with with the dunya with everything and you know most people overseas when they think that they're going to come they love new york city but they're going to live in the bronx they see Times square they see the statue of liberty um but you're going to live in the bronx you're going to live in harlem you're going to live in queens i mean harlem's nice you might not get to live in harlem like harlem is expensive now you're going to live in Brooklyn and not Williamsbridge. So, you know, when these, when you kind of come down to earth, then it's like, it's too late now, you know, because you've already committed your life to it. And, you know, mashallah, at least she stuck it out and tried, and tried her best to raise her kids. But, you know, she was never able to get that impression out of her head. And, um, you know, it became very difficult for the whole family. Um, and it's very, it's very strange, you know, how sometimes we don't know how much that um, that mentality can affect us ourselves and like those around us. Allah um, Mustafa, may Allah have mercy upon us. Amen, 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 amen. Jazakallah khair, uh, Omar, for that share. And when, another very important point that uh, you pointed out was that issue of going back and dialoguing with your parents about all of the negativity that you are faced with in your household. Right, SubhanAllah. This becomes an issue, right? Because as long as she stayed, right? She stayed with him all of that time, subhanAllah. And I get to you right now, Abdul Rashid. She stayed with him all of that time and complained all of that time, it seems like. And it's like, you know, well, why are you still there, right? Why are you staying there, right? You know, sometimes I, I, I really, really, especially new couples, man, um, your business at home, you know, don't share that stuff with your friends. Right? Don't share that stuff with your, with your in-laws or your, your, your mother and your father, inshallah ta'ala. Why? Because oftentimes then you are painting a picture in the heads of those individuals. And if you stay with your husband or if you stay with your wife after all of the negativity that you've painted, you kind of look in their eyes as if you're stupid. Like, you know, why would you stay with them? You know what I mean? Why are you being a fool? You know, why would you continue living that type of life, right? And now you've really placed yourself in a bad predicament because you don't want to look a particular way in front of the family, but you were the one who began spilling the beans on how you feel. And then now, you know, if, and, and let's say per se, let's say, let's take, let's step away from the case for a minute. Let's say your husband or your wife end up changing and becoming a good guy or a good woman, right? Now, You've made the journey for them and for yourself to kind of get back into the good views of your parents and friends, extremely difficult, right? Because now it's just like, no, they're never going to change. You know, you're just, you're just blinded by what you think has changed, but it's not changed. And perhaps maybe they have changed. Maybe they have asked Allah for forgiveness. Maybe they have turned to God and asked me, you know, forgive me for my shortcomings and my sins. Make me a better man. Make me a better woman, right? But you've already dragged them through the dirt. And now when they're up, they're dirty and dusty. And now it's hard to get them clean again, right? You know, if you have issues, go to the therapist. Go to a counselor. You know what I mean? Um, go see the imam who should be referring you to a therapist or a counselor, depending on how deep 
you know, the scars and the emotional trauma is, inshallah ta'ala. Um, but don't just go and just let loose with a friend or family because wallahi, you know, many, in many instances, you may not get good advice. You may not be encouraged to, to change. You may not be encouraged to work things out. And at the end of the day, you drag the person through the dirt. And if they end up being good afterwards, it's too hard to clean up that cement at that point. Go ahead, Abdurashi. Bismillah. Uh, so that's, uh, that's funny. Uh, my wife and I were talking because uh, we just celebrated uh, an anniversary. And uh, someone was at, we were talking because we have friends who've been divorced or whatever. And we was like, well, how come we, we were able to do this for so long? And then she was like, well, that's because we never, we never had nobody in our business. And I, and I was like, you know what, you're right. Because, you know, obviously you've been married, you've been married more than two years, you've, you've gone through some stuff. But um, well, we've been married, you know, over 20 years or whatever. And, um, and the thing is we had ups and downs, but, you know, I don't ever remember, I definitely go to my mom because she's, <laughs> she's crazy, but I love her. Um, <laughs> But I never, you know, I never felt like I need to go to anybody, even my best friend to tell him, you know, you know, how I, how I was feeling when I was mad. Most of the time, if there was a problem, I probably was a, the problem. And after I, after I, you know, sat around a little while, I figured it out, right? Um, but yeah, I never, and, and, and on her side, the same thing, like, she, you know, as far as she was telling me, you know, she never went to her girlfriends or her, or her mom or her sister and was like, you know, why she this, why she did, why she that. And I never did that either. And so I was like, that's really, that's, that's very, that's very profound. And of course, the other thing is that, you know, of course, uh, you know, mainstream media sells us this fairy tale about what marriage is supposed to be. And, uh, and, and it's, it's gone so deep, you know, it's on the internet, you know, everybody's looking at uh, Instagram and Facebook and they're looking at this person, that person, and how their life is. And most of it is, is a facade. And then two, even if it, even if it were true, you're only getting one, a, one, a, one glimpse of what's going on in, their, in, in, in a marriage couple's life they're not showing you all the bad stuff they're only showing you the good stuff and it's the it's the you know it's the it's the it's the the problems that make the marriage you know the working through the problems that make the marriage stronger not the being happy and you know balling all the time and traveling the world that's that's the that's that builds you know a strong marriage absolutely absolutely no no wallahi mashallah you, you are, you are, you hit the nail on the head, mashallah, tabarakah wa ta'ala. I'm also Sister Malia, when Brother Omar was talking, she said, I agree with the brother, the sister took no accountability for our own actions. Many immigrants think they are coming to America to work and save and build a mansion in their own country and go back. Yeah, many stay, end up staying, unfortunately. Um, they come and they with the mindset, I'm going to go back, you know, in three years, five years, you know, three, four, five generations later, they're still here, inshallah ta'ala, right? Um, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them. We know that things change and become difficult. And sometimes uh, what's going on back home in those countries as well um, is a sign of why they stayed as well, inshallah ta'ala, right? It's not just the, the finances here and the money here, but sometimes, you know, unfortunately, back home in those countries, um, it's not a good uh, situation going on. Um, another issue she, she talked about was the whole issue of, I had no one to discuss this with, whether or not he was the, right in keeping me dark regarding our joint finances, right? So she, she, she mentioned how they had joint finances. I mean, they had a joint bank account. All the money goes into one account. And um, that, you know, he would only give her enough money to buy basically the groceries she wouldn't be able to use her own money for whatever she wanted. Um, basically, he was taking the money and he was sending money back home to his family. Um, she asked to be, for money to be sent to her family. He was like, no, like we need it more than they needed. But <laughs> at the same token, he was sending money to his family, right? And one of the issues with the, with the, with the, with the finances that I have, to, I have to talk about and make clear, inshallah, to Allah, because in many instances, and I know us as imams, sometimes we mess it up and it sometimes it's our fault, um, is that, um, you know, here, you know, if they had joint finances, then basically they should have both had access to them, right? We both have access into the, to them, inshallah ta'ala. No one is, you know, uh, no one is denied access to that account. We both know what's in the account. We both can go in and take out whatever we need from the account. But we know that the family comes first. We're going to pay the rent. We're going to pay the mortgage. We're going to pay the car. We're going to pay the electric. We're going to pay the gas. We're going to buy the food. You know what I mean? We're going to buy the kids the clothes, right? Everything that is a necessity is going to be what's going to be used first. And then inshallah ta'ala, we have extra play money. And then we go ahead and we use the play money for whatever the play money is for. Um, 
And, you know, this is an issue of learning to cooperate together, right? Um, you know, in many instances, because Islamically, the woman's money is her money, right? Um, the man has no right to her money unless there's something in the contract, the marriage contract that dictates that, you know, she's going to help or aid in the family or whatever have you. Other than that, the man, that qawama that the man has is basically the right to maintain the household. It is his duty to maintain the household, to pay the bills and, and the likes, inshallah ta'ala. Um, but if the woman um, decides to give, then we know as in the hadith of the Prophet Sallam, that, you know, it would be a sadaqah for her, right? That it would be a charity written down for her for whatever she gave. Um, in many instances, the imams, we mess it up and we say the man's money is the woman's money as well. Um, there's truth to this, but it is not how many understand the statement to be. Meaning the man that has the qawama, he has the, the, the obligation to spend on his family. Now, can the, does this mean that the wife can get access to the man's account and do whatever she wants with his money? That's not the understanding. What is the proof for that, right? You may ask me where the proof is when Hint, she came to the Prophet Sallallahu to complain about Abu Sufyan being stingy, right? She says, he's a stingy man. He's not, he only gives me X amount of dollars. He's not giving me what we need. Can I go and take extra from him, from what we need? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, yes, but only what you need, right? So if the man's money was the woman's money, then the Prophet said, take whatever you need because his money is your money. He says, no, take only what you need, okay? Which shows that the man's money is his money as well, right? But he has responsibility of taking over um, the bills and managing the finances in the home, inshallah ta'ala. And inshallah ta'ala, as in many cases, some of the scholars said he can give his wife, you know, a, uh, an allowance, um, money to spend for whatever it is that she wants to spend it on, you know what I mean? However it is, they want to manage the household, right? But the other thing that happens is that in many marriages now, when we approach the marriage with these two issues, well, my money is my money, your money is your money. I had a brother who called me not too long ago about this, you know, with his wife on the phone. Imam, how do we understand this? You know, her money is her money. I can't look at her money and see what she's doing with her money, but she wants to look at my account and see what I'm doing with my money. You know, does she have that right? And I was like, honestly, no, that's your money, right? And that's her money, right? I said, but what ha what's happening now is that you guys have turned your marriage into fighting over money, fighting over this belongs to me and that belongs to you, rather than saying this is for the house, right? This is for us, inshallah ta'ala. And many times that happens, why? Because in the mind of some people are, uh, the, in the mind of some people is the thought of one day I may get divorced. And I need to protect myself and prepare myself if I end up divorced that I don't end up broke, right? But then that ends up bringing issues into the marriage because you're thinking of your marriage failing. And because you're thinking of your marriage failing, now you're thinking of, I need to go ahead and take my money and hide my money and it has to be mine, it can't be his and her, it has to be mine, it can't be hers. And you end up in this systematic battle over finances and you have bigger things in life to worry about, right? Especially in this time and era, raising children in this time and era, you know what I mean? Surviving in this time and era, your faith, you know, atheism, we're being faced with so much, right? That money is not an issue. It should never be an issue in the household. It should be, understand, it should be understood that yes, you know, the man is going to take care of the household as much as, as, much as he can and whatever he can with inshallah ta'ala, and the woman has every right not to work, right? But then on top of that, the woman can't say, well, I don't wanna work, but then I have to live this type of a lifestyle as well. You know what I mean? Well, you have to live the lifestyle that your husband can afford you if it is that you don't wanna work, right? Or that he can provide you if it is that you don't wanna work, right? So sometimes we have these uh, dual standards going on and these prerequisites that we put in front of us. And a lot of times it's just obstacles to our happiness. Honestly, it's just obstacles to our happiness. At the end of the day, the money, we can't take it with us, inshallah ta'ala. It stays here. We go into the grave. Our lives are short. We're going to be questioned for everything that we do. And the last thing, 
you know what I mean, that we're going to be worried about is money, your Mokiyama. Unless, mashallah, you have taken your money and you're investing it in, 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 in sadaqa and in uh, sadaqa to jariya, things that are going to be an ongoing charity and the likes, that subhanAllah, that at that point, okay, now you invested your money well, but if you're talking about money to buy a dress and to buy boots and to buy shoes and to buy a car and to buy sneakers and to buy a hoodie or whatever it may be, you know, the, the reality is that none of it is bringing you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So don't allow that to be the source of issues in the household, right? Don't allow that to be the source that causes you to find the spouse, right? Like she did, she was like, he was poor, right? A doorman. He went to America, he got rich. Oh, he becomes interesting now. I'm interested. I get to America, she finds out he's not rich. Oh, I'm gonna have to work. Uh, but now he's the type of man who, he wants to take all of her money from her, right? Because he doesn't understand some principles Islamically as well, right? And then now money becomes an issue in the household, right? And then the issues continue to grow and grow and grow until it grows out of control. And then all of a sudden you can't um, come back from that stuff. Munira, bismillah. Um, I don't know if I'm the only one who like saw this, but it seems like in the beginning, the husband was working one job. And when she decided to start buying like lavishing things for herself, he then, you know, started to work day and night, which she complained about more. Um, the other thing I, but the other matter is actually is a question for you because I have heard um, this from like some of my friends who are married that, you know, when it comes to them working, the husband wants to support their side of the family, but the woman, or sometimes they'll say, well, you can't support your side of the family. Like, what are the, the right way to do that? So, so again, here we're looking at uh, the issue of the finances, right? In this, in this particular story, she wanted to use her own money to take care of her family, and he said, no. Okay, obviously that's wrong right? Because it's her money. If she wants to take some of that money and send it back home to help her family or use it here in America to help family she has in America, inshallah, tell her if it was a different case, that's her business, right? And at the end of the day, he should have been on board with that, right? Because like we mentioned last week, right? Her family's your family, your family's her family, right? And at the end of the day, you're married into each other's families, right? Um, so, you know, the issue of now, let's say she doesn't work, He's the only sole provider, is his money. Um, and he takes some of his money to send to his family and maybe whatever he has left, because you know, these these questions are very difficult to deal with, right? Because you don't understand the dynamics of what's happening in that household. This is why I don't like fatawa too much, right? In terms of general fatawa, um, that people just open up and they go to Islam QA and they read a general fatwa and they say, Oh. Sister, this is your condition. Oh, brother, this applies to you, right? No, why? Because that fatwa that was given, that ruling that was given was based on a specific question that that person asked for their scenario. Your scenario may not be equal to that, right? So this is why I don't really like that, these questions too much, but I'm going to try to answer it, Munira and Shah, trying to give it as much justice as possible, because sometimes we have to be able to ask multiple questions to kind of come to um, a, a decisive factor of what should happen in that household. But the scenario, I'll give you a couple of scenarios. The first scenario, she doesn't work, the husband works, the husband makes okay money. He has family overseas, they need some help. He naturally sends to his mother, his father, his brother, whatever have you, whatever he can. But and then whatever he has left over is to maintain and take care of his family, his, his household. Now the wife may say, well, you know, my family needs as well. He may say, I don't have enough right, to send to your family as well, right? So now can you say, you know, he's completely wrong that he's not going to send to her family and he's only sent to his family? Maybe that's all he can afford, okay? Um, unfortunately, should he split it and say, okay, well, $50 to my family, $50 to your family? Bismillah, if it can help out that way, maybe that would be the better approach, right? Um, the second scenario could be she still doesn't work, he works, but he makes good money. He makes, he makes a lot of good money. Um, and, you know, he sends money to his family. He pays all, all of his bills off and he still has left over. And then the wife says, you know, my mother is suffering. Can you help my mother? He says, no. <clears throat> you know, in this case, I think he really just doesn't have love for her family and maybe not even for her, right? Because loving her family is part of loving her, right? Uh, 
and you would want to see her mother okay as well or her family okay as well just like you would want to see your own mother okay and this is why the hadith of the prophet love for your brother or your sister what you would love for yourself is important right you're not a believer until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself i want my mother and my father to be okay my family to be okay I should want her family to be okay as well, right? And vice versa. Then the other scenario is just that, you know, he works, she works, they both make money and they both send money to their families and nobody should be prevented from that, inshallah ta'ala. Um, but always, you know, assuring that they're not breaking their household down in the process of that, right? Because you don't want to take care of other people and then you can't take care of yourself. Because eventually, if you can't take care of yourself, then eventually taking care of other people will stop as well, right? So you want to be kind of cautious of that as well. So I think, you know, the scenarios can go multi a, multiple, a multitude of ways. And it really all depends on Sister Munira on a case-by-case -case scenario and really looking at those cases in detail and really seeing uh, and, and investigating what is the issue in those cases, inshallah ta'ala. I would say don't take any of the generality and apply it anywhere. But those friends that have that issue, have them contact the imam, inshallah ta'ala, local to them <coughs> or any scholar and, you know, try to have their situation analyzed for them to get a ruling based on their situation and see, you know, if they can be helped out and assisted in that, inshallah ta'ala, and Allah um, knows best, inshallah. We have a comment. Uh, it says, I totally agree. Marriage is supposed to be private. People should not know your business because some people feed on that and don't mean well for you. Couples should resolve problems on their own and not involve other people unless it's a professional like an imam or a counselor, etc. No, absolutely. Definitely um, agree with the comment. Um, you know, uh, <coughs> unfortunately, you know, sometimes and sometimes people are jealous of what we have and sometimes they want to destroy what they have, what you have and they want you to be miserable like they're miserable when they're looking for a companion, right? And I've seen a lot of that happen as well, unfortunately, inshallah ta'ala. Um, we have a few minutes, inshallah. If anybody else has any other comments, you can also raise your hand, inshallah, or send messages, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, there was a few other things I wanted to look at. Oh, the other thing here was um, the whole issue of she said, I began plotting all sorts of, of misery that I could put him through as a payback for his monstrous ways, right? This is a severely unhealthy relationship where you're looking to pay each other back, right? Meaning I'm going to do something to you to hurt you because of the way I feel hurt. That relationship has become unhealthy completely. And in some cases, even dangerous. Why? Because if you go down to the, the end of the bottom of that page, she begins to talk about how she hurled, right, um, certain words at him, you know, use certain vocabulary and probably along those best, even maybe curse words, right? And then that at the end, when he walked out, she picked up a vase and she threw it at him and trying for it in his head and it missed, subhanAllah, right? But now imagine if those words, because she said, I said words to him that I wanted to hurt him with, but his thick skin, walhamdulillah, walhamdulillah, his thick skin did not allow it to affect him, right? She was pushing the buttons, right? And unfortunately, sometimes people do this. Don't do this, brothers and sisters. Don't push buttons, especially when you're arguing with an individual and you're fighting and you're debating and it's heated. Don't push buttons that you know are going to hurt, right? Or affect the person emotionally. Why? Because some people are triggered the wrong way sometimes. And sometimes shaitan comes in and affects a person's mindset and they black out and sometimes they do things they wouldn't have done if they weren't triggered that way, right? Unfortunately, and this goes both ways, unfortunately. Don't trigger and don't help shaitan to, you know what I mean, cause your relationship to become abusive or anything else, right? Because in that moment where you're pushing buttons, you're abusive. You're emotionally abusive. Right, you're abusing that person emotionally and mentally, trying to take them to a place that you shouldn't take them. And then what happens when that person gets to that place and the devil pushes them and all of a sudden they do something stupid that they shouldn't do, then all of a sudden now it's like, how could you do that, right? But you were pushing the buttons, right? It's like going out and you're smacking the bull 
on the tail or you got the red flag and you're holding the red flag in front of the bull and the bull charges at you and hits you. And you're like, well, how could the bull do that to me? You know, what were you fly, fly, you know, why were you sitting there holding the red flag in his face and poking him with the, with the, with the, with the knife, right? What did you think he was going to do, right? SubhanAllah, and this goes both ways, not only the male, but sometimes it may be the female side as well, right? Um, because domestic abuse and domestic violence and this type of violence in the home is not always from the man's side. We have many, many cases we heard of women domestically abusing and violently hurting their husbands as well, SubhanAllah, right? So don't do that, right? Don't push those buttons. And then we see that she threw something at his head. Imagine she would have hit him in the head, in the back of the head, so she could, the man could have died, on, depending on how thick the vase is. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself in a whole nother place now, right? With a court case because you killed your husband accidentally out of rage and out of anger. You know what I mean? SubhanAllah, right? Rage and anger are the sister to insanity, right? This is why the Prophet sometimes says, when you get angry, he says, go make wudu. And if that doesn't help you, sit down. And if that doesn't help you, lay down. Right, SubhanAllah, he gives us steps to try to help us to remove and relieve that anger. It's also why I usually tell couples, inshallah ta'ala, when you're angry, sometimes this isn't the best time to dialogue and try to figure the situation out. Way too often, that's what we want to figure it out. Why are you not talking to me? I'm trying to talk to you, but you're not, you're not listening to me. What's your problem? I'm trying, you're, you know, you're, you're disrespecting me. Listen, <laughs> let's talk about that later. Right now, we, we, we're both... Alterado, as we say in Spanish, we're both, you know what I mean, hyped. You know what I mean? This isn't a good moment for us to talk. Nothing good is going to come out of it, right? Let us go calm down. Let us go put water on the situation, meaning we'll do, right? Inshallah, I'll tell you, it's a nice cold we'll do. Let us go pray Turaka'a. Let us sit down. Let us ponder and reflect. And then let us come back to the table and talk when we're calm so that we know that shaitan is not present. Because shaitan, he, his job that he tells his henchmen, his jinn, he says, your job is to divide and conquer and break it apart. And when you do, and if you do, you're going to be the one that sits right next to me. You're going to be my confidant. You're going to be the man, right? And everybody in shaitan's army wants to win that position. So they're going to push and they're going to shove. Don't let them do that to you, inshallah, okay? Don't put yourself in that position, inshallah ta'ala, and in that predicament, inshallah. And we have a comment that says, subhanAllah, can't talk where I'm at. Um, their relationship did not start off on solid grounds. Also, there is always his story and her story, then there's the truth. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, inshallah ta'ala, you know? So, um, and this is why looking at both sides of the story is always very, very important, right? To decipher, and it's why the Prophet Sallam, even when the people would come to him and says, you know, watch it, because some speech could be like magic, right? You can convince me that you're right, but if you're wrong, you're just taking yourself to the fire of hell because I'm going to give you rights that don't belong to you, right? And it takes a lot, right? It takes a person of strong faith to say, you know what? I was wrong. You know what? It may be my fault. You know what? I may be the issue and I may be the problem. Way too often as human beings, we always want to point the finger at the other person. We're never the problem, right? But sometimes we have to sit back and reflect on everything, inshallah ta'ala, and find out first, let me see, man, where, where I make my mistakes. Way too often, I'm too worried about the next person's mistakes, whether that's in a relationship, whether that's in a friendship, whether that's in the masjid, whether that's in with other human beings at the job. You know, I'm too worried about why that person does it that way. You know, why do I do what I do that way? You know what I mean? My way. You know, maybe... They don't like the way I am, you know what I'm saying? So inshallah ta'ala, this is just some of that, uh, you know, uh, advice and Sister Anne Marie, she says, yeah, it's always best to do the 24 hour rule, <coughs> give things time, inshallah ta'ala, cool down and, you know, let things be for a while, inshallah ta'ala. And if things, um, uh, let things kind of cool down and cool off, inshallah. Um, Talked about that. Talked about that. Talked about that. Oh, another quick uh, sign of the demise of their relationship was when they both started sleeping in separate rooms, right? When you start sleeping in separate bedrooms, 
you know that your marriage is out the door, you know? And then when she says, you know, I basically stayed around and I put up with it for my kids, you know? And what we see at the end of the story is that it did more harm to the kids than it did good, right? Because it emotionally and mentally affected the kids where they didn't even want anything to do with their parents and the, the way their parents lived, like, lived afterwards, subhanAllah. You know, and this is why, subhanAllah, staying for the kids sometimes is more harmful and detrimental than leaving, right? You don't stay for the kids, you stay for yourself, right? Because the kids, inshallah ta'ala, in many instances, mashallah, they, 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 they can surpass and get past the issues of divorce and these things, as long as, mashallah, you put them in counseling and therapy, inshallah ta'ala, that helps them to kind of deal with the situations both parents in that in the in the divorce process are not trying to kill each other and you know drag each other through the dirt but both parents are basically telling the children listen it's it just you know we're not meant to be together you know what i mean but we're both here for you to help raise you to be here for you for whatever you need emotionally physically financially we're here for you guys. That's never going to change, inshallah ta'ala, right? But when you have those relationships, oh, your father, your mother, and your father, and your father, and your father, your mother, your mother, your mother, you destroy the concept of the father, the mother, and the, and the head of the kid. And then subhanAllah, after that, you know what I mean? The kid ends up messed up as well, right? So, you know, again, don't stay for the kid. You stay for yourself. And as Allah says, as we remind often, keep them in kindness or release them in kindness, inshallah ta'ala. And then we saw that she was making the same mistake with her daughter, right? In terms of saying, you know, she wanted a doctor, a Syrian doctor to come and marry her daughter who was going to, you know, do it the right way, right? But again, she was considering money and wealth and status over faith, values, morals, etiquettes, right? And sometimes this is where we fell our children because we push them into these different corners, inshallah ta'ala, right? When there are many other things that are much more important than wealth and status, you know what I mean, in life, in a relationship, and in a person, inshallah ta'ala. And we should be looking for those things instead, inshallah ta'ala. And if we can get the wealth and the status on top of that, then alhamdulillah, that would be uh, great, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, one of the sisters online, Sister Miriam, she says, I just need to say that we have a lot of our daughters who need to get married, but there's no men around. Unfortunately, sister, I agree with you. Unfortunately, I agree with you, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I don't know what the solution to that is. I, I'm, I'll be honest with you at the moment. I'm totally at a loss as to what the solution is <coughs> and why our sisters are around. We made this point last week. You know, our classrooms, our events are filled with sisters, and many times we don't have men around. And, you know, that causes, unfortunately, at times, um, there to be an imbalance, inshallah ta'ala. Um, Sister Morita, she mentioned that childhood trauma for those kids, you know, and she should not be blaming the kids. Definitely. I agree with you 100%. You know, it wasn't the kids' fault, inshallah ta'ala. It was her and her husband's fault, and they definitely uh, brought trauma onto their children that they shouldn't have brought trauma onto them. And, you know, honestly, I think the whole family should have went for group therapy. You know, that's one of the other points that I've mentioned, that I think the whole family should have went uh, to group therapy, um, and possibly it would have been a good thing for all of them to see a therapist <coughs> and deal with the issues um, that were happening in their household, inshallah ta'ala parents, children, and the like, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. Um, and Sister Munira, she says here, she doesn't know a doctor, may have even worse characters, subhanAllah. Correct. We don't know, subhanAllah. And, uh, you know, if, uh, Brother Omar says, it would have been a beautiful family to save, mashallah. Yeah, Allahu Akbar. And I, again, I just think that, you know, uh, way too often, one of the things that we forget again as well is that we try to save these relationships when they are already too late. Uh, you know, it's already too broken, it's too far gone, you know what I mean? You know, right in the beginning of you and your, your spouse having issues in your relationship, go find some help. <coughs> Again, therapist, counseling. I mean, help is not the family, it's not your sister, it's not your brother, it's not the girl at work, it's not your boy at work. You know what I mean? It's someone who's going to be unbiased, 
someone who's going to look at both sides, inshallah ta'ala, and advise both of you, inshallah ta'ala, not because, oh, you're my boy, I take your side, you're my girl, I take your side, you're my family, I take your side. No, but someone who's going to help you and give you, mashallah, um, tools uh, that would help to kind of move your relationship into a place uh, that is healthy, inshallah ta'ala. Any final comments? I know I'm over 11 minutes, and I apologize for that, inshallah ta'ala, but you guys contributed to uh, so many uh, good reflections today, mashallah. I really appreciate the contributions today, mashallah. <clears throat> So if there's uh, no final comments, no final reflections, no final questions. Oh, Omar. Go ahead, Omar. Unmute yourself. Oh. Yeah, no, mashallah, jazakallah khair. Um, you know, I think that it's 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 good. It's one thing to like, you know, hear about these stories. Um, it's another thing to put in the work. And, um, you know, whether whether you're married or whether you're not married, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole other thing to put in the work. It's a whole other ballgame. And, um, you know, many times in hindsight, you know, we'll say like, you know, this could have happened like this or happened like that. Um, but we don't put ourselves in a position to succeed beforehand. Um, you know, like you said, when it's when it's when the saving can be done. You know, when the little things are happening, you know, when it when it's it's OK for us to swallow our, our pride, when it's OK for us to change our perspective on life, uh, given the reality that we're living in and not like make ourselves the victim or somebody else the victim. But rather like, you know, just alhamdulillah, qadr Allah, this is the way my life is going to be. And, you know, it's, it's comfortable. It's good. I have my family around me. And, you know, it's 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 a lot of these things. Um, but, yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely a whole nother thing to put in the work and finding somebody who's willing to put in that work um, is very, is very important. You know, we definitely have to be of those people um, that, that, that need that, that put in that work, just like we want somebody else who's willing to be patient, um, who's willing to be considerate, who's willing to be, you know, under, understanding and to um, do their part and, you know, one last thing is many times we're very uh, aware and very vocal about the rights that others have upon, uh, that, that we have upon others. My money, this, that, but very seldomly uh, do people care and wanna know the rights that others have upon them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's that's a huge one. That's a huge one. That's one thing that I've been seeing. And, um, you know, mashallah, may Allah help us all and uh, protect the families of the Muslims and increase the Ummah, I mean. I mean, I mean. Sister Mariam Jaloudi, who is on Facebook, um, she was saying that there should be some type of course for people who want to get married that they can kind of go through together, inshallah ta'ala, and know um, what marriage is all about. Sister Mariam Muhammad, this is what these courses have been about. This is our third course. Our first course actually focused on um, the marriage process itself, how to find a spouse, you know, how to find the husband, how to find the wife, the wali, the guardian, um, the walima, that, you know, I mean, everything attached to marriage, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so inshallah ta'ala, alhamdulillah, you know, that those courses can be found on YouTube. The second course revolved around how to maintain a happy household, looking at the Prophet Sallallahu in his house, looking at the five love languages, inshallah ta'ala, and how to use those love languages to learn the love language of your partner, inshallah ta'ala, and learn to speak that language, inshallah, so that you're talking in their language and they're talking in yours, and there's communication going on in the home. And then now the third course that we do, we, you know, we're, we're completing is uh, looking at failed marriages and how to not fall into the issues or those uh, negative things that, you know, marriages have uh, um, so you can, you know, find those on YouTube, inshallah ta'ala. If you need the link for that, just uh, DM me and I can send those to you as well. Um, Sister Sandra, um, you know, she mentions here that sometimes the man refuses to seek professional help and the wife is willing, but he is not. And then Um Sumeya, she says that Sandra, that is a common narrative, subhanAllah. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, one of the things we want to stay away from is saying a common narrative, um, because the fact is that we haven't done any... Um, type of surveying, right? To see what the percentile is of 
do's uh, versus don'ts or willingness or unwillingness in shadow tolerance. If we do that type of survey, um, then we may be uh, misrepresenting um, you know, the, the, the male, the men or the females, inshallah ta'ala. But what I, I would say is that, yes, you know, definitely sometimes uh, the man may resist uh, going to um, therapy and counseling. And, I, and, and in that case, I just suggest continuing to try to talk to him, inshallah ta'ala, um, and figuring out why, um, you know, during our last marriage course, one of the things that we suggested is going to someone who doesn't know that person, right? Or who doesn't know the two of you, um, maybe outside of your community um, where you are, because sometimes people fear that, um, you know, we have big mouths <laughs> as human beings and we carry tells. And even though your therapist is not supposed to carry that tell or carry that story back into the community, but he may fear or she may fear that, you know, they may know me and then maybe someone in the community is going to find out and is going to spill out that we were here getting counseling and then the people are going to look at us in a certain way. And because of that, people stay away from counseling. So keep trying, inshallah ta'ala. Um, if he doesn't do it, you know, feel free to do it on your own, right? Just because he doesn't do it, mean, it doesn't mean that you can't do it, inshallah ta'ala. And then perhaps maybe with him seeing that you are doing it, inshallah ta'ala, and sharing some of what you um, have gotten out of it, perhaps maybe he'll go and do it, inshallah ta'ala, at that point. You know, and Allah ta'ala knows best, you know what I mean? Allah ta'ala knows best. But again, <clears throat> you know, and maybe sometimes um, seeking help uh, from someone else who, you know, it's, 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 it's a person who they won't be offended if they came in and tried to assist your family um, to get someone else to convince them of that, inshallah ta'ala. And definitely, um, as you mentioned, Sister Sandra, they both have to be willing to work for it um, and to be able to save their marriage. And I think that that's important. Sister Monera, she says the community needs to be stigmatized using going to counseling. And I agree with you 100% Sister Munira. And alhamdulillah, <coughs> I am proud of Mass New York for um, starting our Brooklyn slash Staten Island social service department. So alhamdulillah, we have a social service department. Um, and we have, mashallah, uh, our beautiful, mashallah, believers leading that department. Um, and they specialize in different things from family therapy to, you know, children therapy to all types of things inshallah ta'ala that we may need in our communities and they're connected to a network across the u.s um, that is able to mashallah help you and help benefit you if you don't want someone in your locale you know if you don't want someone in your locale you can always also do telehealth right inshallah ta'ala and <clears throat> do something on zoom and meet with someone you know i mean that may be on an, in another part of the country inshallah ta'ala so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of that brother abdul rashid go ahead Yes, I'll try to be quick. So yeah, um, so yeah, you know, uh, in order to have a successful marriage, it's like having a house. You have to have a solid uh, foundation. And, uh, so for us, it's 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 Islam. It's uh, the way the Prophet, following his his example. So when brothers and sisters are trying to get married, they need to remember that, and remember that they're getting married for you know uh, a purpose, and uh, and it's a shared purpose. You know, to build a to build a community and build a family and to be each other's comfort one day in, in, in paradise. So, you know, like for me, you know, I, I don't remember the last time I had my own money. It's just our money, you know? It's um everything we do, especially since we started having kids, you know, to make sure they're better off than we were as, as, as kids and to make sure, you know, we can give them a little something so they could, they have some, something to build their lives upon. And um, so I think it starts there. And, uh, and of course, you know, not every marriage is perfect and doesn't, doesn't go, go smoothly, but yes, I think brothers and sisters should always uh, uh, avail themselves of whatever resources they need that the community can provide to keep those marriages together. But of course, like you said before, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, then, you know, you move on. There's no, there's no shame in being, you know, get, getting divorced as long as you handle your responsibilities, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know why brothers and sisters are, are, can't seem to find the right person or the right whatever. But I think they need to, young people today need to look at why do you want to be married in the first place and and go about it thinking thinking about it the way the prophet did. Um, and I think, you know, we'd be better off, you know, because I, I see so many comments in so many rooms or, you know, there's so much uh, uh, back and forth. Women bring blaming the, dude, the guys, the guys blaming the girls, the guys like the girl wants a million dollars in dowry, the guy, only, you know, he, he only makes $30,000 a year. And, you know, that's legit, but, you know, you got to give a little to get a little. And say that again, you know, 
<laughs> yeah. And, um, and, you know, if you have these, and I, you know, everybody should have high standards. You should want, you know, you should want the moon, I guess, but you have to be real. You know what I'm saying? If you want the moon, then you must be, you must be a pretty star. So, so, um, so you got to work that out, you know, and, uh, and I'm pretty sure you're not the only star out there. So I think brothers and sisters need to, 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 to make it real, you know, be real with themselves first and then be real with the, you know, whatever person they're trying to get with and know that it's not going to be easy and, and we're going to we're gonna have to work this out and you know, I can't have it all. You can't have it all. We got to work it out. And, you know, that's my little two cents and, you know, may Allah make it easy for all of us. That two cents is, uh, is heavy, man. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, that, that two cents is a really uh, great advice, especially the, 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 the point where you said that, you know, uh, you know, marriage isn't perfect, man. <laughs> all right. Marriage isn't perfect. If you come into, come into marriage thinking that you're going to have a perfect marriage and you're going to be happy for the rest of your days all of the time, that's not real. You want to I, haven't, I haven't met that person yet. Never met the, I mean, even the prophet, right? We were, we're learning not even the, the prophet. We're not running in the, the in the other class that you know he he, he divorced one of his wives because he was a little upset with her because you know she wasn't real. you know she wasn't acting right and, you know then Allah had to step in but that's real though so that's real so so you know if he wasn't if he didn't have a perfect marriage then what makes you think you're gonna have one absolutely absolutely man and and I think when you if you take that advice that brother Durashid right brother Durashid mashallah has been married 24, 25 plus years right mashallah. Allah gave him a long, uh, a long marriage and some death with his wife. I mean, um, that, you know, this is wisdom, right? Coming from a man who's been married for a long time, alhamdulillah, has gone through it, experienced it, inshallah ta'ala. And, you know, the reality is that we say it all the time. Marriage is work. Marriage is sacrifice. You have to work at it day in, day out. You know what I mean? In, the, in, in those imperfect moments, you have to work at it. And when you have those perfect moments, then you sit back and you enjoy those perfect moments, alhamdulillah, and you soak it all in. But alhamdulillah, when those imperfect moments hit, alhamdulillah, you work at it and you strive for it. And inshallah ta'ala, you get back to that beautiful moment again. And alhamdulillah, you soak it up in, you soak it up and you kind of just continue to go through that, you know what I mean, that motion in life. And, and you know, brother, as Brother Rashid mentioned, you know, that was one of the things my father told me when I had my first child. He said, you know, I did whatever I could for you. I worked hard. My father used to work two, three jobs sometimes. You know what I mean? He said, I worked hard so that you guys wouldn't be brought up the way I was brought up when I was in Puerto Rico, right? And here when we first came to America, so that you can have more than I have. He says, and I expect you to do better for your children, right? And, and it's a principle that I've tried to live by, that I try to do better for my children than what, than what I had, than what my parents had. And I think that that's a beautiful principle, inshallah ta'ala. And it's not just about giving them things, but it's about giving them a better quality of life, inshallah ta'ala, especially when it comes to um, faith and iman and, and spirituality, inshallah ta'ala. So, you know, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Um, Sister Munira, she out of here, mashallah. And I apologize, everybody, inshallah, you guys are keeping it live. <laughs> um, she says there needs to be a course or conversation on mahr and the amount people should spend on the wedding. I think my generation has got it wrong, sadly. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that, you know, the whole issue of mahar, I think, um, is a problem. You know, sometimes we are over-exaggerating and making marriage very difficult. And this could be one of the reasons that a lot of men, you can't find men as well, because sometimes they can't afford the mahars that are being put at them, put in, for them, in front of them. And then also the whole, you know, wasting, you know, an abundance of money on the, on the, on the, on the wedding banquet, you know, and, and the party. Is ridiculous. You know, we have a place close to my house here that we found out um, that they charge like $300 a plate. If you have 100 people, that's a $30,000 wedding. You know what I mean? It's like, for what? You know what I mean? That $30,000 can be used as a down payment on your first house, a down payment on your car. You know what I mean? You know, your honeymoon. There's so many things that that money could be used, better used for than spending it on one night so that other people come and have fun and eat up a whole bunch of food, right? And you feel that joy for that one night. Yes, it's, an, it's, a, it's a moment you never forget, alhamdulillah, but you can have a moment you never forget without having to be um, wasteful and extravagant to that, um, to that extent, inshallah ta'ala. Abdul Rashid, go ahead. Yeah, that's so true. I remember when me and my wife were talking about getting married, that was, I was like, you know, how about the justice of peace? She was like, well, you know, I'm gonna have a nice wife. I said, well, listen, you know, we agreed. If we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it nice, but we're gonna do it on cheap. 
because we wanted to go on a honeymoon, you know, and um, and I'm, you know, up until, you know, the start of the wedding, you know, I was like dragging my feet about because I, I kept thinking about the money, whatever, because I was like you were saying, I was like, you know, car, house, whatever, whatever. But then, you know, of course, I'm glad that we had it because I had a good time and, my, you know, my, our families had a good time. But at the end of the day, I'm glad that, you know, we, you know, you never make your money back, of course. At least I, I haven't met anybody who makes the money back. Um, you got to invite people with money to the wedding. That's why. That's the only way you make the money back. You know what I mean? You gotta yeah, uh, money I've money been to back. some of those and I, I know they didn't make their money back. But go ahead. Anyway, so, yeah, so, um, <laughs> so, um, because the more it costs, the more you got to pay, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, so, you know, so, I mean, I think, yeah, so have a, have a nice wedding. You don't have to have, like you said, a, you know, I mean, it's, you know, times are different and it's much more expensive now. But, you know, we've seen horror stories about couples who, who were like the perfect couple. They had a wedding and it was, you know, million dollar wedding. And then, you know, two years later, they're not together no more, you know, for whatever reason. I'm not saying that's the only reason, but I'm sure that was part of it. Because, you know, you know, you, that's a lot of money you lose. Huh? Yeah, um, but Alano's best, though. So, no, no. I, and I agree with you, subhanAllah, that, uh, you know, I, I won't even mention that. My wedding, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah, I tell my wife I'll make it up at our 25th, inshallah. <laughs> my wedding was super duper humble, and I, I can't tell you how humble it was. It's probably like a wedding during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. So I think that, but that's where I was at that back then at that moment that humbly laughed. But mashallah, yeah, but you're still we'll married have, though, so that's so you know, it, it a, worked out. A, yeah, so we'll have a good 25th, inshallah, Tala anniversary, inshallah. Um, sure. Premarital, Sister Sandra mentions premarital counseling. I highly um, agree with Sister Sandra. If you can do premarital counseling, please do it, inshallah ta'ala. There are many institutions now that actually offer it, Suhba being one of them. And um, I don't know them personally, but I've heard many good things about them. Um, so I do recommend if you can afford to get and pay for some premarital counseling, go to the program, inshallah ta'ala, together. And I think it'll be a, a benefit, inshallah ta'ala. Um, uh, let's see if there was anything else. I think that's it, inshallah. So, khair, inshallah, brothers and sisters, uh, thank you for your du'as. Those who prayed for my sister as well, alhamdulillah, she had her beautiful baby boy. They sent me a picture. I'm looking at it here, alhamdulillah. So, mashallah, tabarakallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, alhamdulillah. Brother beautiful. Lebron. Another LeBron added to the family, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> so, Jazakallah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And don't forget, tomorrow morning we have Quran from 7 to 8. Tomorrow night we have our class on the Women Around the Messenger at 8 p.m., inshallah ta'ala. May Allah's peace and blessings always be with all of you. Assalamu alaikum.